So I think, I think we've all been uh, very focused on, on why we do minimally invasive surgery. I, I think shouldn't be always, now at, the point, at this point, I think we can all say it's not why, but why not do it. Um, there are a lot of papers in the literature that are kind of interesting as you start to justify the transition in your own practice or maybe to your referring physicians and colleagues. And I, I think this particular paper uh, probably held us back a little bit, which is a, uh, it was a uh, meta-analysis looking at 4,600 patients uh, published about eight years ago now. And at the end, the overall meta-analysis suggests there was marginal benefits, uh, if any, in perioperative mortality, but there was reduced intensive care unit stay, hospital stay, and ventilation time, although increase in cross-clamp and CPB and total operation. And at the conclusion of this paper, uh, which is basically a, that minimal access AVR can be offered on the basis of patient choice and cosmesis rather than evident clinical benefit. The problem is that this was really, if you look at the paper carefully, normal risk patients uh, going back uh, quite a number of years before and not really the population that we're seeing increasingly uh, over the last several years. Um, I think Larry Cohn, uh, in his experience with mini astronomy, was quite helpful. He published uh, several papers. Uh, this was on the first thousand patients, uh, showing that it was safe and feasible and well tolerated, even in the elderly. And in fact, a uh, follow up paper looking just at octogenarians uh, showed uh, with a mean age of 84 and an SCS um, uh, predicted rate of mortality of 10.5, the actual 30 day mortality was only 3%. And uh, the long-term outcomes matched in a matched survival uh, group controlled for age uh, were equivalent. And I think that his conclusion was by provocative, which was these data provide a benchmark against which outcomes for transcatheter aortic valve implantation could be compared. Um, and there's no question in a very focused program, even with high-risk patients, that you can achieve quite low uh, operative mortality in this population. And uh, Dr. Lamellis, said, uh, I think a very important landmark paper um, looking at median sternotomy versus million invasive was one of the first uh, to really have a detailed analysis uh, comparing the two, showing that he actually sh showed a lower morbidity and mortality when compared to full sternotomy. Uh, in my own experience with over 700 cases of mini sternotomy, this is going to be presented soon, so I'm only going to give you a little bit of information, um, which had a large percentage of the patients early on who were being considered for TABI and part of the partner trial. There were no deep sternal wound in, uh, infections, no sternal instability, and a mortality rate at 30 days of less than 2%. And um, these mortalities included some cases that pr pretty much aren't getting surgery these days because they're going right on to a commercial TAVR or in, entered in a trial like a 94-year-old with a periop CVA, a 78-year-old who developed renal failure, cirrhotic, who refused dialysis, 87-year-old VF arrest with a thrombose uh, drug-eluting stent on post-op day five, an 88-year-old respiratory failure, um, post-op day 21 refusing tracheostomy. So, you know, some really extraordinary cases, and I, th I think those are pretty much being excluded from our practices these days in the, in the uh, era of TAVI. Um, although there have been a number of different uh, approaches to minimally invasive aortic valve, a lower sternotomy, a parasternal sternal incisions, really, I think we've evolved into these two preferred techniques, and Joe gave us a great uh, perspective on the right mini thoracotomy. I like it very much. I, I feel there are some limitations to the right mini thoracotomy as there are to the mini sternotomy, and, and therefore, I think having some facility with both at some point in time is helpful, although I think for a surgeon just starting minimally invasive surgery, as Dan mentioned, uh, the upper mini sternotomy <clears throat> doesn't change a lot of variables to your procedure initially, um, not a lot of modification in the visualization and the cannulation, et cetera. And I, I recommend that the, uh, the first incision that you try is an upper median sternotomy into the fourth inner space. You can go to the fifth space and you still have sternal stabi stability down low where most of the forces of the chest are, are vectored. Um, and it gives you some broader, and as you get more comfortable and more comfortable, you can even move to the third inner space uh, in, in many of the patients, probably 80, 85%. So I make a small incision uh, just above the uh, uh, angle of Louis down to near the fourth inner space, and then um, dissect up to the sternal notch using a single uh, sternal uh, saw uh, maneuver just starting at the top and then jaying into the fourth inner space, uh, being careful not to uh, be too aggressive on the turn so you don't get into the, uh, the vein and the artery. Sometimes you do, and uh, a clip is, is necessary. Even if you don't see bleeding, I always try to see if I can find the um, the mammary vessels um, and control them. So um, uh, I like, there's a number of retractors out there. Uh, the S-Tech-like retractor, I'll just say, uh, there's some of them now with lights that uh, I'm, I've also been using without promoting anything in particular, but you can take your headlight off and, uh, and uh, use a, a lighted retractor. It's, it's a quite nice and, and uh, one less thing to bang against your assistant in the field. I open the pericardium over the aorta in the right atrium using heavy pericardial sutures and pull them strongly under tension to, to bring the uh, aortic root into the field. 
And at this point, uh, assess the venous access. So if I can't see the right atrial appendage uh, at all or, or very little, I'll consider going to the groin for uh, femoral uh, venous drainage. If it's sometimes it's right in front of you, and in fact, very easy to both put a uh, venous cannula as well as a retrograde cannula if you wish to uh, use retrograde. Uh, moved away from retrograde routinely now in these cases using uh, custodial as a single integrate uh, dose of cardioplegia. A central aortic cannulation with a standard aortic cannula. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> early on, I, <clears throat> I was probably um, uh, less aggressive with LV venting, um, but I think really it's essential. Uh, partly for uh, de-airing, but uh, also if you have a sick heart, there's no way you can you can really uh, uh, do too much to help that heart uh, in, if you're not uh, unloading the ventricle on a, on a wean from bypass. So I've just made it routine. Also, I think for de-airing, um, it can be additionally helpful. Um, then you just perform a standard aortic valve replacement. Standard instrumentation uh, is fine. You don't if you like using uh, normal uh, needle drivers and forceps, that's fine. No new instrumentation is necessary. I find shafted instrumentation very helpful. In fact, I use it on full sternotomies um, and, and uh, right side as well. It's nice that you can use a shorter shafted instrument uh, on the aortic valve versus the mitral instrumentation. And uh, Cornot, I, I, I'm a big fan of Cornot uh, for a number of reasons, uh, not because it really makes the operation go much faster, where it might be true in the mitral um, mini thoracotomies, but I think that it helps you tension the knots evenly all the way around. And also, uh, if you have a small root, uh, putting your fat finger down there six times. I have a six six uh, rule, not a five rule, but I go down six when I'm tying my nuts. Um, but it, it, it keeps you maybe from traumatizing the aortas and very fragile aortic roots. So um, it's become my routine. Uh, as Joe said, you got to get the pacing lead on before you unclamp. Otherwise, you'll never find the right ventricle uh, when the heart fills up um, with blood. And even if it's decompressed on uh, bypass, it's sometimes very difficult to get the needle in there. I use a mediastinal blake from the sub position before separation from bypass. Um, you can also put it in through the right chest. Uh, and a nice technique, I know if Ross rules here in the audience, there he is. He, he taught me, which I also use from time to time, is to make a chest tube incision in the right chest and put your venous cannula in through the chest. And uh, not unlike uh, the retraction effect that Joe has with his loop, uh, you can pull down in your venous, uh, venous drain and expose the aortic root nicely. And I routinely plate the sternum. I started doing this with all the osteoporotic patients in partner a trial, and it got to the point where I, I believe that it creates a lot more stability and, and also pain control. I mentioned Cornot, a uh, really handy technique. There's a great display out here, and, and Jude Sauer, the founder of the, of the um, uh, company, is here. He's also a, a surgeon uh, who uh, has come up with a lot of innovative ways to, uh, to uh, accelerate procedures and also make them safe. He's a great guy to pull, pull aside and talk to for a few minutes. So this is uh, the setup. Once you're in through that incision, as you can see, everything's through uh, the mini sternotomy, uh, aortic cannula, uh, ascending, uh, aortic cardioplegic anagrade, retrograde, and, um, and the venous cannula. Great exposure. Um, and there's really no, no looking down through that long tube. Dan was talking about getting used to being in a limit, limited exposure. This, uh, most of the time, unless you're in a, have a very unusual patient with a very uh, vertical mediastinum, Everything really comes right up into the field. Uh, further elevation of the aortic valve by putting three commercial sutures really gets, uh, gets the exposure to a quite easy uh, level. Sometimes the, the valve is just a centimeter below the, the sternum uh, in slender patients. And afterwards, it's a nice cosmetic result. Um, a lot of these patients are, are frail, and, and uh, uh, it's nice to not have to do the full sternotomy. This lady was pre-liver transplant. Um, uh, she had critical aortic stenosis and six weeks after mini AVR. It's nice not to have an incision down to the, where she needed her chevron incision for a liver transplant, but uh, she went on to have a successful liver transplant afterwards. Um, a lot of techniques very, again, straightforward through the mini sternotomy. I, I think you can do many of these, uh, if not all, through the right side as well. Uh, but this is a more kind of a familiar perspective, so aortic valve replacement and repair, root enlargements, uh, extensive NR directomies of the aorta um, for if you have a porcelain aorta. Uh, Bentol procedures, aneurysm, morphe, even hemi arch repairs uh, are the only thing just modify the cannulation technique uh, into the axillary artery um, when you're going up higher in the aorta. Well, a few years ago, uh, uh, Dr. Cohn, I'd say uh, it's kind of sad. I don't know if you all heard Dr. Cohn just died a couple months ago, unfortunately, um, after complications of aortic valve replacement. Um, it's kind of like Dr. DeBakey having an aortic dissection. You know, go figure how that all works. But anyway, uh, he was on a podium talking about doing redos, and, and uh, I, would, I was saying, wow, if he can do it, I can do it. 
And so we, um, in, the, in the era now with all the advanced imaging that we're getting in most of these patients who are being evaluated for TAVR, um, you, get, you can get pretty comfortable. I'll show you some um, planning uh, videos here in just a second. But it, it's, uh, with axillary cannulation, I've, I've moved more to putting a graft on the, uh, uh, on the axillary artery if I'm uh, cannulating there, uh, unless it's a very large artery, then I'll do direct cannulation. And then a venous cannula from below. Uh, if you have a good idea on your, on your CT scans where everything is, same upper uh, sternotomy using an oscillating saw and uh, just a little bit of time to get the chest open and release uh, all the adhesions. Just leave the mammary artery open and when you're putting in the sutures by the left main, put a peanut over it to cover it and, and whip your sutures through there. It's really not, not so bad and, and the hearts tolerate um, that regional perfusion uh, quite well, uh, probably contrary to our, uh, what we were taught earlier in our careers and in our training. Um, so preoperative planning for, for, for me for minimally invasive cases is pretty much the same as for TAVR. Uh, probably 90% of times when they get to my office, they've already had their CT anyway, uh, or we're getting a CT uh, to see if they are a candidate for transcatheter valve replacement. But it is helpful to see where the aorta is, the, what, which direction it's pointing. Um, if uh, I'm not quite as uh, detailed as Mattia Glauber, who I think is speaking later today on choosing an exact um, uh, degree of angulation where I would switch from the right side or in a very vertical aorta going centrally. But it is helpful to give you an idea where the landmarks are, and again, especially in the redos. Advanced imaging has really helped us a lot. Some of it are, looks like pretty pictures, but um, you can re work with your, with your radiologists um, and start to get a lot of interesting pictures, get some familiarity with the mediastinum uh, and your patients ahead of time and see if you've got a centimeter or three centimeters or four centimeters, what the aortic um, aorta looks like, where the calcifications, what the aortic root and aortic valve calcification is like. And now we do measurements ahead of time and uh, have a pretty good idea of what kind of annular size we have and, and um, if we're going to need to predictably do an aortic root re replacement. Um, additionally, there's some fantastic technology. I've been working closely with uh, my colleague Carlos Ruiz and the Phillips folks with um, uh, doing a lot of image fusion. And uh, whether we're, in this case, uh, looking at a mitral valve or a double valve procedure done percutaneously or with um, a transapical versus a, uh, a, um, a direct aortic or, uh, or transfemoral approach, we get all the information and understand where, um, what our options are, where the lung is, if we're going to do a transapical approach, or if we're going to do a direct aortic a TAVR or mini AVR, all the information comes. And I can sit at a workstation and just move the chest around and, and, um, and feel like I've got a pretty good dry run of, of what I'm uh, going to anticipate, uh, what I'm going to find when I open the chest or when we do a transcatheter valve. So can we make minimally invasive AVR better and safer? I know this is going to be touched later on, but I, I still think there's ways to do faster operations, uh, um, and get better hemodynamics, and, and also re remove the pathologic valve. Um, and uh, ischemia is bad. I uh, heard somebody say yesterday, well, we do pretty well. The patient's on bypass for an hour, but this is a great uh, a study was just a few years ago in journal heart valve disease from Renucci in Milan, where they looked at um, a large number of patients with uh, aortic valve replacement, and they showed an increase of 1.4% uh, risk of morbidity per minute increase in, um, in pump time when looking at a large uh, number of patients. You know, kind of wonder, is this our door to balloon time equivalent? If we can do a faster operation, a more efficient operation, um, and still be safe, um, you know, maybe there is an opportunity to really uh, cut down our, our pump time, and especially in patients that may be a, a borderline between TABI and, and, um, and transcat and uh, minimally invasive aortic valve. This is particularly uh, uh, influenced in low ejection fraction patients, diabetics, um, and showed the most you know relevant clinical benefits uh, in this in this subpopulation. And that's just basically because of uh, that's really pushed a lot of us to consider uh, faster ways to implant valves uh, now. Percival valve in here in the middle is now commercially available in the United States. I was part of this trial, and it's a very easy valve to put in, great hemodynamics, and uh, it does cut down your time. A lot of folks uh, are naysayers saying it doesn't cut down their time much, but if you believe this Renucci paper that every minute counts, um, maybe some reconsideration of that philosophy is warranted. So, whosoever desires constant success must change his contact with the times. Not a cardiac surgeon, but a very, very thoughtful man. Um, and uh, where a man's heart is, there is his treasure also. Um, the patron saint of Milan, I think, this morning, since it was all filled, this session was filled with Cubans and Italians, I thought we should have a couple of quotes from, from Italy here. So, in conclusion, minimally invasive aortic valve replacement appears to be beneficial, desirable, and, and, and clearly quite safe, particularly in elevated uh, risk patients. Standard dispatation and cannulas are uh, acceptable in the mini sternotomy, but I think some facilitating technology is, is quite helpful. Advanced imaging is helpful to determine the best approach, and especially in, in reoperations. 
And there may be added benefit um, with sutureless valves. I'm looking forward to hearing uh, Dr. Glauber speak on this a little bit later. So I thank you very much for your attention.